Rocket Lab's Electron rocket suffers a failure, Stoke Space finally hops, and SpaceX flies another record-breaking booster. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 22nd of September, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Stoke Space has finally done it. The Hopper 2 prototype vehicle has finally flown. The flight took place on the afternoon of September 17th from the company's test site at Moses Lake, Washington. Flying up to 30 feet in altitude, or 9.1 meters, Hopper 2 took a short 15-second flight, but in that time, it demonstrated a lot of things. This was the first time the company had flown its upper stage engine, which is a hydrogen-fueled expander bleed cycle engine with 15 combustion chambers, and it'll be 30 for the full-scale version. It's safe to say that this is something that hadn't ever been done before. Sure, maybe thought of or conceived on paper, but no actual tests like this exist. The engine also demonstrated differential throttle control for takeoff and landing, also a first, as it had only been used prior for ascent but not landing. Two examples of this are the N1 rocket and SpaceX's Crew Dragon launch escape system. This flight also demonstrated the vehicle's regeneratively cooled heat shield, which obviously didn't have to go through re-entry, but it was still running nonetheless during the test, something that'll give the company at least some in-flight data about it. With this, the company has now become the second to perform a vertical takeoff and vertical landing test of a reusable upper stage after SpaceX's Starship. Stokes says it will now move its focus to developing the first stage of its upcoming fully reusable medium-lift launch vehicle, a rocket that still doesn't have a name. Hey, maybe Stokes should run a contest for that. While the second stage uses hydrogen as its fuel, the first stage is intended to use methane for its fuel, with the booster main engines being full-flow staged combustion engines, the same engine cycle as SpaceX's Raptor. You can see some of the similarities here, and it's not a coincidence. Stokes' plans for this rocket are for it to be fully reusable and to be able to refly it within 24 hours. This is very similar to Starship, so it's no surprise that we do see some common elements between these two, even though Stokes' rocket will be much smaller. So here's hoping we see a lot more progress on it real soon. NASA is already preparing for its Artemis II mission, which will feature the first human mission to the moon since 1972. The agency rolled out the SLS Mobile Launcher 1 last month, and since then, it's been testing a number of upgrades to the tower and launch pad systems. This includes up to 100, yes, 100, swing retraction tests of the crew access arm to qualify the system in all different weather conditions and retraction speeds for the arm. Earlier this week, on September 18th, we also saw a test of what NASA calls the Ignition Overpressure Protection and Sound Suppression System the water deluge system, in more layman's terms. This will be one of the few tests that the Exploration Ground Systems program will be running with the SLS ground support equipment. However, it wasn't all hardware that was tested this week. We also got to see the humans that will fly on that Artemis II mission. You know, the real deal, the actual people, the astronauts, you guys. Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Cook, and Jeremy Hansen, the crew of Artemis II, spent the morning of September 20th rehearsing day of launch crew activities. This consisted of the crew suiting up at the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, walking out those famous doors, riding on what NASA calls their crew transportation fleet, and going out to Launch Complex 39B. There, the crew took the elevator up 274 feet on the Mobile Launcher 1 tower and walked down the crew access arm to the white room at the end of it. The test pretty much ended there, as there's no rocket on the pad to board just yet, but both flight and ground crews were able to simulate the whole process up to that point. It's so cool to know that we are this close to sending astronauts back to the moon, and it really is starting to feel real. Over the last few months, NASA's Exploration Ground Systems program will continue testing the Deluge system and the crew access arm, and will also be performing installation and testing of the slide wire basket system used for the emergency crew escape system at the launch pad. We have a great article on our news site by our writer and photographer Nathan Barker talking all about the launch pad changes and this set of tests that you should definitely check out if you want to know more in depth. Testing of Mobile Launcher 1 is expected to wrap up around late fall, and then it should be brought back to the Vehicle Assembly Building to prepare for stacking of SLS for Artemis 2.
And by the way, the first segments of the solid rocket boosters for that SLS are expected to come into KSC next week. So you can bet we'll be keeping our eye on that when it happens. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. A Falcon 9 lifted off on September 16th at 338 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B-1078, was flying for a fifth time and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. Moving over to China, a Changzhong 2D rocket lifted off on September 17th at 4.13 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The mission was carrying the second batch of three Yaogan-39 satellites into low Earth orbit. This is the fourth launch of Yaogan military reconnaissance satellites in just the last two weeks, clearly indicating an increased launch cadence of these kinds of satellites. Another Falcon 9 launch took place on September 20th at 3.38 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was carrying another batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites in support of Starlink's second generation constellation. The booster, B-1058, was flying for a 17th time, breaking the record for most flights of a Falcon booster. If you remember, this is actually the booster that flew SpaceX's Demo-2 mission to the ISS back in May of 2020, and it has successfully supported another mission yet again. As is now typical for this booster, it successfully returned to Earth, landing on SpaceX's drone ship A Shortfall of Gravitas. With this mission, SpaceX has now launched 5,135 satellites into orbit, of which 349 have returned and 4,097 are in operational orbit. A Galactic Energy Series 1 rocket suffered its first launch failure ever this week while performing the Autumn Sonata mission. Liftoff took place on September 21st at 4.59 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying the second Jilin-1 Galfen-04 remote sensing satellite for the Changguang Satellite Technology Company. However, several hours after the launch, the company confirmed that the rocket had failed to perform its mission and that the payload had been lost. This is the first failure of the Series 1 rocket, which was flying for its 10th time overall and the 5th time in just under 2 months. The SmallSat launcher had been the preferred commercial launcher out of China for its reliability and was increasing its cadence to meet the demand, which included the recent debut of Galactic Energy's marine launch platform just earlier this month. Sadly this week, we also had another launch failure, but this time coming from Rocket Lab's Electron rocket. Electron's 41st flight started off on September 19th at 6.55 UTC from Launch Complex 1B at Rocket Lab's own private spaceport in New Zealand. The rocket was carrying the second Acadia satellite for Capella Space into a low Earth orbit. The first stage flight took place nominally, but after stage separation, the Rutherford vacuum engine on the second stage seemed to fail to ignite. This was evidenced by the decreasing speed seen on the broadcast telemetry after the point at which it was supposed to ignite, and then the video feed was cut off as well. A few tenths seconds later, the launch director confirmed Electron had an anomaly. And all stations, I just uh, we have experienced an anomaly. Um, please remain on station and we will investigate and action the anomaly plan. The mission came just as Rocket Lab was going through its best year, increasing its launch cadence and performing seven electron launches prior to this, with one haste launch in June. This is definitely a tough setback for the company, with Electron's third launch failure, all due to second stage issues. The big question now is what happened? And the answer is, we don't know. Rocket Lab will now have to go through the proper procedures to investigate exactly what went wrong and then work through a mishap report with the Federal Aviation Administration. If you want to learn more about how those work, DOS actually hosted a great explainer video about Starship's mishap investigation the other week. Hopefully Rocket Lab can solve this latest issue and return electrons safely to flight real soon. In much better news, this week we also had the launch of the latest crew rotation mission to the International Space Station. Liftoff of the Soyuz 2.1A rocket with the Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft took place on September 15th at 1544 from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The Soyuz MS-24 took a two-orbit rendezvous profile to reach the station, docking with the Rosviet module at 1853 UTC that day. The spacecraft was commanded by Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko and included flight engineers Roscosmos cosmonaut Nikolai Chub and NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. 
Both O'Hara and Tube were flying into space for the first time, while Kononenko was flying for a fifth time. The launch of the Soyuz MS-24 crew rotation mission now kickstarts the handover period with the crew of the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft. This will include a change of command ceremony, set to occur on September 26th ahead of the departure of Sergei Prokopiev, the current ISS commander and Soyuz MS-23 crew member. Prokopiev will then pass the station command to Andreas Mogensen, who will become the sixth ESA astronaut to command the ISS. The Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft is set to remain on station for six months until March of next year. Some of the crew, however, will be staying on the ISS for a bit longer than six months. While Laurel O'Hara will be returning on Soyuz MS-24 after the crew handover in March, Kononenko and Chub will remain on station for another six months afterwards and will instead come back on the Soyuz MS-25 spacecraft. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA's Mars Helicopter Ingenuity had its highest flight to date on Mars this week. The 142-second flight took place on September 16th and consisted of a simple up-and-down trajectory. The move took the helicopter up to an altitude of 20 meters above the Martian surface, breaking its own record for highest powered flight on Mars. Oh, and by the way, this was Ingenuity's 59th flight. Yes, 59th! That is a mind-blowing number for a technology demonstration that was planned to conduct just five. And if things continue to go well, that number's only going to get higher and higher. Ingenuity already has its 60th flight scheduled to occur next week on September 25th. This week, space tracking company Leo Labs announced that on September 13th, it detected a near-miss in orbit between two pieces of space junk. The event happened between Cosmos 807, an old 400-kilogram Soviet satellite that was launched in 1976, and the upper stage of a Chongzheng 4C rocket that was left in orbit five years ago. Leo Labs calculated that each object's center of mass came somewhere between 23 and 49 meters from each other, with a probability of collision of 1 in 1,000. This is a really close call, taking into account that each body is several meters across, and each one was moving over 10 kilometers per second relative to the other. This event shows, once more, the dangers of old derelict pieces of debris being left in orbit with no way for them to come back down within a reasonable time frame. Rocket Factory Augsburg has revealed this week that it's working on a cargo spacecraft called Argo. The company hasn't revealed a lot of information just yet, we'll have to do an update about it when they do, but from what it has said so far, the vehicle will be designed to carry up to 3,400 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Now, Given the mass that it can carry, the spacecraft itself is obviously much heavier than that. For reference, Cygnus can carry about the same mass, and it's 9 tons in total mass. That means that Argo won't be able to be launched on an RFA rocket, but don't worry, RFA says that it will be launch vehicle agnostic, so it will be able to launch on any rocket that has that performance capability. One interesting tidbit though, is that the spacecraft is meant to have an integrated inflatable re-entry module. We'll have to see what other details RFA releases next, but it's certainly an interesting proposal from this European launch company. NASA has released a request for proposals for U.S. companies to develop and build a spacecraft that can safely deorbit the ISS at the end of its life. According to NASA, the intention with this is to provide more robust capabilities for responsible deorbit compared to the previous plan of just using the Progress spacecraft. Under this contract, the spacecraft would have to be quickly developed, and only one would be manufactured, so it would have to include several backups and failsafes to make it capable of surviving different failure scenarios and still do its job. Well, we certainly don't want that day to come. Yes, at some point, we will have to say goodbye to ISS. India's Aditya L1 Solar Observatory is now on its way to the Sun-Earth Lagrange Point 1. The spacecraft, launched back on September 2nd, has since been raising its orbital apogee around the Earth, and finally on September 19th, it performed the transfer burn to reach this point. ISRO says that it expects the spacecraft to reach the L1 point about 110 days after this maneuver, so that means by January, India should have its first solar observatory up and running. The U.S. Space Force has awarded ABL Space Systems a contract to demonstrate responsive launch capabilities. The launch will be part of the U.S. Tactically Responsive Space Program, or TACRS program, which is the same one under which Firefly flew its last mission. Under this contract, ABL will maintain launch readiness at two separate deployed launch sites and will receive the order to launch at either one of them. 
In the meantime, ABL says it's gearing up for the second flight of its RS-1 and will announce a launch date in the near future. And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. A Falcon 9 is set to fly next week with another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites from Florida. Launch is planned to occur within a 4-hour, 31-minute window that opens on September 24th at 6 past midnight UTC. NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is set to return its samples from asteroid Bennu in just a few days. Landing at the Department of Defense's Utah Test and Training Range is scheduled to occur on September 24th at 1455 UTC. Another Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg is set to take place next week on September 25th within a 4-hour, 20-minute window that opens at 711 UTC. The mission will be carrying another set of Starlink satellites. A Changzheng 4C rocket is planned to launch next week on September 26th at 2018 UTC from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. As usual, the payload hasn't been disclosed for this mission. The Soyuz MS-23 mission is set to come to a close next week with the return of the spacecraft and its crew of three. Undocking from the ISS Prashal module is expected to take place on September 27th at 7.51 UTC. Landing in the steppes of Kazakhstan is scheduled to take place about three and a half hours later at 11.14 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.